Okay. Uh, great to see everybody here in beautiful LA. I love being down here because it's always nice. And it's warm. It's, it's, it's a good life. The coffee is a little too far away, but <laughs> those are little things to complain about. Um, well, uh, it's a pleasure to have everybody here. Of course, I know a lot of you guys, and uh, I just I want to talk today about some things we've been working on, sort of give an overview. Um, I've given it this title here around coordinates, governing equations, and some of the limits of what you can do with some of this data science. Um, so really, everything's going to center around coordinates and dynamics. And that the two are inseparable. You have to have both of these things going for you to sort of, I think, start building good models. Okay? So this is something that we're obviously pushing, but it's also something that you see, and I'm going to highlight a few people here, like Giannis uh, talked about this in his talk uh, about representation, the coordinate systems of representation of that data. So you know, a lot of people here, Frank as well, in terms of some of the molecular dynamic simulations that he's doing, Igor Mezic is doing a lot, of, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, there are a lot of people here that are kind of essentially circling around these concepts of coordinates and dynamics together, that they, they kind of need to be partnered with each other. Uh, this is really work featuring a lot of people. I'm just like the spokesperson, the hired hand to give you the talk, but here's where the real work comes. So Kathleen's sitting right back here. She's spending the, the quarter here, and uh, I think that's where we're going to end up in terms of where this drives to is this, this result that Kathleen has. I want to talk about some of the work that Brian De Silva has recently done on some of the limits of what are there. Bethany started working with us early on. She's now at Argonne. And then uh, I don't know who this guy is. with this? No. <laughs> Steve, right here. OK. Uh, by the way, it's intentional that I put this in the background, because I think this is, in some sense, the canonical model that came out of physics. This, in my view, sort of, in some sense, established what physics was as a discipline, which is uh, the grand challenge was celestial mechanics for a long time. And so here, what you're seeing, this is the retrograde motion of Mars, and this is the retrograde motion of Saturn. So you look at the night sky, you start seeing this. And then you ask the question, so we wanted to discover physics models for this. And let's talk about the early models for this. The early models for this was the doctrine of the perfect circle in the, that came out of the Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt. Okay. It is historically, like the Roman Empire, what will be, I think, ultimately one of the longest lasting theories that we will ever have, about 1,500 years before it was finally disposed of, right? Um, but here's these great pictures of the Ptolemaic coordinate system, which is the Earth is the center, and all of this retrograde motion could be explained as circles on circles, right? So you start thinking about this motion, it's a circle with a circle with a circle with a circle. It's a perfectly fine representation. It's accurate. In fact, they had refined this thing very well. It became a very accurate representation of the motion. One way to think about this is a very early version, a first version maybe, of a Fourier transform, right? Which is a bunch of frequencies. You add them together. You describe these motions. So that is kind of where it stood for about 1,500 years until it started being becoming apparent that maybe there was a different coordinate system to start considering. Uh, and that is the heliocentric coordinate system. So you have the, the discovery here. So you start off with Galileo starting to posit this. He built the first telescope and started doing these things. And so through the lens of the sun being the center, it's a very different, it's, it's in some sense a much simpler representation, right? You get these ellipses. And Really, Kepler was the one who established this. Now, it came at great cost to Galileo to stick with the thought that the heliocentric universe was correct. It cost him a great deal, right? He was imprisoned. He, later his life, recanted all of it, said he was completely wrong, kept in house arrest till the day he died. Kepler, the, but the idea was there, and it just kept growing. Kepler built on this, built his elliptical orbits, started saying, hey, these are actually the orbits of the planets. This was followed. Once you had that coordinate system, then you could start building things like F equals MA, right? Um, 
And what we know is even F equals MA wasn't quite right. This is the representation of dynamics in the right coordinate system, right? You get F equals MA provided you are in that coordinate system of the heliocentric universe, right? That's where you get that. So you have to have the coordinate and the model together. We know it wasn't quite correct because Einstein said, actually, the coordinate system is a little more complicated than that, especially around large gravitational objects. This is where we currently are. Undoubtedly, I think, we'll show that this was wrong, that there's more to this story. But this is the current version of what we have. By the way, this idea of coordinates and equations is not new. It also pervades a lot of other disciplines. Reduced order models, for instance. Reduced order modeling is all about finding uh, a proxy model that you can simulate very quickly in place of some high fidelity model which takes forever. So the whole concept is maybe I have some PDE, I can take snapshots of this PDE, and what I can do from those snapshots, do an SVD and find some low rank structure, some low rank modes, and let's call these phi of R, so some R rank system instead of an N dimensional system, and now I can project into this space. So now I say let's go ahead and project into this space, this is a projective version of that full PDE, but now I have an R-dimensional set of ODEs, which is much smaller than this N-dimensional large-scale PDE. So then you can do very rapid simulations on, on this. So again, coordinates, equations in those coordinates. So that pairing is sort of the, the push that I want to uh, advocate here. Uh, before going too far, though, I do want to start this is a question I think we should ask before we start any of these problems is um, what's the nature of your data? So for a lot of physical systems, what you're going to do is going to depend a lot on the answer to this question. Right? So you, I think in data science you can't just say this method will work across the board. The first thing you say, what's the data look like? What can I actually feasibly do to do some things? So quality of the data. And what I mean by this is signal to noise. Okay, and I'll come back to that issue. There's only so much you can do if you, if, if you have noisy data, right? No, I'll come back to that. Quantity of data, what are you actually observing? Are you observing the state space or not? And then are you trying to extrapolate or interpolate? That's, that, that's a very important issue. And sometimes it's not that clear, right? So I'm going to come back to this in the sense that this idea of generalization, when someone said, someone's I always get nervous when it says, oh, look, the model generalizes. It works great over here, and it wasn't in my training data. That probably means you're interpolating. Okay? You don't know it necessarily, but you, you are. This is the only place these things work. Um, okay, so let's start here with model discovery. Uh, this is about finding governing equations from time series measurements of a system. Here's the mathematical framework. So, so this is a very generic model layout. What you're doing is you're saying there is some system, dx dt, let's say underlying, I'm measuring a physical system. Let me say that is, uh, of the, the data itself is evolving according to some dynamical system, f. Okay? It can be high dimensional, low dimensional, whatever it is, it's there. f prescribes the dynamic, x is the state space. Inevitably you're going to have parameters in there. And you may even have some stochastic effects. Okay? You don't actually get access to x. You get access to y. And y if comes through a measurement model h. Okay? So you don't see x directly, you see h. Now, if h is the identity, that means you measure the state space. You are measuring what the variable is. You always come imbued with noise. So here's the question. I give you just snapshots of data. Your job is to discover H, F, theta, sigma, all of it. All right? You can't, it's an ill post math problem I just gave you. Okay? Which means it's impossible. So the only way you're going to solve this is you're going to have to start to come to the, the idea that you're going to have to figure out ways to regularize. In other words, impose constraints. That's, that's the whole game in the data science. You, from the measurements, do the best job here. By the way, I will only advocate one possible way to do this. There are many 
people working on this for different reasons and for, with different objectives. Okay, so I'm just going to give you one version of this. I don't want to say it's the correct version. You could say Ptolemy was wrong. But you cannot argue with the fact that Ptolemy's predictions were spot on. You might say it's a wrong model, but it works perfectly reasonably well. However, a lot of us think that Kepler was right, but that's, that's hundreds of years later. It took a while, actually, for people to switch out to Kepler, um, even though it was sort of the right model. So just throwing that out there, I'm not trying to make a value judgment on all these other methods. You could just simply try to train a map from Y to some X, some latent variable space, and just say, let's just build a neural network to do something. That's one possibility. Um, and I want to talk about the brand of what we want to do. And the workshop is focused on <coughs> interpretability, right? That's one of the key themes here. So I want to go Normal to... Normal forms is a... What's that? Normal forms is a good example. Normal forms a good example, exactly. There's so, much, there's so much here that we can take advantage of, right? Um, but I think towards interpretability, I want to highlight some old, old concepts that have been around for a long time. Okay, so the stained glass, William of Ockham, Ockham's razor, right? So the fewest explanatory variables is kind of the more cor most correct one. That's, that's a very loose statement. There's no math theorem to this, but sort of in some sense, it's like don't over explain things, right? That was sort of what William of Ockham was trying to do. And by doing that, right, you come down to the smallest number of explainable things for the data, which is in some sense inherently interpretable to some extent, right? Because it's a small number of things that you're trying to make the relationship between a cause and an effect. So this is an old, old idea, right? And this is also picked up by Pareto in, um, in thinking about Pareto fronts, right? So how do I get, you know, there's this famous 80-20 rule that often comes out of this. Like, I can explain 80% of your data with, you know, 20% of, uh, of, 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 inf of information or, or variables. So the idea was this small representation of explaining things. So these are old ideas, and this is really what we're going to try to go after, which is, I guess, the concept of parsimony, which we, let's say, or simplicity. There's, there's different words here, but I'm going to, let's call this parsimony. Um, and I kind of believe in this statement, it's that I think it is the ultimate physics regularization because this is how we've often made a lot of progress in physics. I could write down equations for you on the board and we could play a game, okay, what's that? Oh, diffusion, because you have a u dot equals del squared u. I put an i in front of it, it's dispersion, mode coupling. There's these canonical things we see in physics that are just a few terms. We've learned all of this physics, and we've had a lot of success with physics with very few terms. So you pick up your iPhone. Like, we build technologies off of this. This is not just made up, right? Parsimonious representations. We can build the entire semiconductor industry off of this thing, OK? So the way I'm going to define parsimony roughly is that, or at least in terms of what we want to do for the regularization imposed on that problem I presented is, I want to constrain the number of terms and number of dimensions. Those are sort of the two things I want to keep in check. Okay? Because one way to think about it is, well, if it's just the number of terms, then I could do something like, well, how about if I project to an infinite dimensional space and build a linear model? So dx dt equals ax. There's one term, but it's really high dimensional. That's not what I want. I would like this to be the intrinsic rank of the dynamics itself. I want to constrain this to the rank of the dynamics, and I want as few terms as possible to explain that. So those are the sort of the combo. This is just sort of uh, hand-waving it in some sense. I don't know if we, we don't have a rigorous way to define these things, but you'll see as we go along what I mean. OK, so how do we do it? You have dxct equals something. Well, what could that something be? Well, let's just make up a library. Uh, I think many of you have seen this. Apologies. Uh, but we'll just go through this it's in the architecture, which is sparse identification of nonlinear dynamics. So you make up a library of all the things you've seen sort of in your physics books or things you know. Like I, I said, you could write down, here's diffusion, here's dispersion, here's mode coupling, here's this cubic nonlinear, quadratic nonlinear, all these things that we have seen. You can pick up, go to the library here, pick up the physics books and engineering books, write down governing equations. Put them in here as potential right-hand sides, <coughs> okay? 
So it's only limited by imagination, and it's not just polynomials, right? In the, in the spatial temporal things, you have derivatives, uh, you can have sines, cosines, whatever. Yeah, it's, it's, it can be more complicated than that. This is a matrix A, and all I'm going to solve in this is AX equal to B. Okay? That's as fancy as it gets. The matrix A is there. AX equal to B. The B is going to be, if I give you time series data, I'm going to differentiate it. That's going to be B. So it's X dot is what you're producing from the data is equal to A times X. And X is essentially the loading coefficient for each of these columns. Okay? So let me give the example of this from Lorenz. Here it is. Take time series areas of Lorenz. You can produce derivatives. I make a library. This is A X equal to B. Now, if you hit backslash here in MATLAB, what it'll do is give you a solution. And it'll give you an, uh, a least square fit solution. So what it'll do is say, oh, you know, you're all important. And it turns out for a physical system, you're not all important. Only a few of you are, right? So that's the whole idea of parsimony is not everybody matters. At any one spot in the physics, what we're really after is the dominant balance physics. The 1960s applied math was really based around fluid dynamics. And most of that 1960s math was doing asymptotics to look at different regimes of fluid flow where you get different balance, dominant balance physics. And we learned a ton from that by not taking all the physics that could be there by saying, in this regime near this boundary layer, here are the two dominant terms. Over here, something else. So dominant balance is what we're really going to go after here is how few terms could I pull out of this library to describe that data. And when you do this, then you want to promote sparsity. We do this through least square thresholding. And those dots to show you the non-zero coefficients. Everybody else turns off. Those are the ones that are there. What do you get back? Exactly the Lorentz equations. Okay? So that's it. It's AX equal to B. That's not that hard, right? That's a fairly simple architecture. You can do a lot with this, including going to things like this, where you can start saying, all right, uh, I want to start doing PD, spatial temporal systems. So what I like to do with this slide is sort of show sort of your a lot of canonical PD models that come out of mathematical physics. Um, here you go, KDV, Burgers, Schrodinger, nonlinear Schrodinger, Kuramoto-Shivashinsky reaction diffusion system, Navier-Stokes. <coughs> right. So for each one of these, if I just give you the data, and obviously I know the answer, right? Because I but I give you simulated data and I say, tell me what the PDE was that produced that data, and you can back that out. Okay, and so here's how you can do it. Here's how much noise you can tolerate. This is just details of the discretization for these things. Um, by the way, all the code for doing this is online, so you can just download it and run any of it, both the PDEs as well as the regression models. Now, here's a couple things I want to point out at this point. Uh, one of the criticisms you can level and say, like, well, wait a minute, but you know, you're Surely the physics is more complicated. Why, you know, uh, you, you constrain yourself a lot to polynomials. Here, here's what's kind of interesting. From the dominant balance physics perspective, look at all these models we've written down through the 20th century that have been really impactful for us learning physics. Look how simple they are. Look how most of them just have polynomial nonlinearities. Now, I would say that's a result of the fact that whenever you have measuring a lot of these systems, there is a dominant balance, and that's why polynomials are going to work so well. And it can be polynomials, let's say, in you know, UUX. That's a polynomial with a derivative term, but a lot of physics simplifies here okay? when you're looking at that data. And so this is kind of the philosophy is that you can get a lot of the behavior out pretty nicely within the context of this and also within the context of having polynomials sitting inside of your library functions. Okay, and that's just based upon our success historically to date. Okay? Another comment to make, pretty sensitive to noise. So I'll just throw that out there now. You need clean derivatives. If you're going to do this regression, 
that b, remember b on ax equal to b, is the derivative of your time series data. And so you need clean derivatives. Yeah? So you impose this additive structure, right? So anything that is not conforming to that, like function compositions, so you have to put in your columns, right? So how many columns can you put there before it breaks down? As many as you want. I mean, it's, 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 it's just ax equal to b. So, so when you do PDEs, you have to actually, this ax equal to b gets very big. But it turns out what Sam Rudy did, who did all, all this. Sam showed that, like, well, if you have low rank structure in the dynamics, you can massively subsample this and keep the ax equal to b small. Normally, the A matrix is going to be like this. It's going to be tall, skinny. Even if you have a 1,000 library in months, you might have a million data points in time. It's not a big deal. To, to do. It's pretty easy to solve, especially if you're doing least square thresholding like we are versus, let's say, uh, an L1 actual regularization because that also tends to be kind of unstable. Yeah. All right. So, but here's the fact of the matter. Okay, I was going to change the slide because it's getting old. But, uh, you know, this is debatable. I, uh, <laughs> I have plenty of counterexamples. But what I mean by this is. <laughs> I don't know, I have a PhD. I, somewhere I studied and learned a little bit about some equations, and so did all of you. So when you come to the table to do a modeling thing, you actually come with knowledge, right? You know F equals MA, you know a little bit about diffusion, maybe this, that. I don't think any of us feel like we know enough, but we do come with, we come physics imbued. We know some physics. And oftentimes in the cities, we the, the, the kind of, uh, uh, scientific things we're trying to do, we actually have knowledge of those systems. So if you've been studying geophysics or optics or neuroscience, you had you studied it for a long time. There's a lot of stuff that's already been learned. So part of the idea here is to say you can take the same architecture and to go to discrepancy models. And this is actually talked about in a talk yesterday, which is I actually know quite a bit. So we have partial knowledge of physics. But oftentimes it turns out that partial knowledge is not, like I run my model and I look at the data and they don't match. Even though I know the things that are in my model are correct. I can even maybe derive them from like conservation laws, this, that, or the other. So you're in this situation where you say, okay, I have a model, I run it, doesn't match the data as well as I want, I'm missing something. So what do I do? I need to discover the missing physics. That's what I'm after. Okay. So notice that this is nothing really changes in that our ax equal to b architecture. The only thing that happens is this f of x, since I know it, I can move it to the left hand side. It's now part of b. So b is the x dot minus f of x. So I take all the physics I know, I put it in there, I do the regression now, the ax equal to b solve. Where all I'm trying to do is find a parsimonious representation of the missing physics, okay? That's it. So still AX equal to B, nothing too fancy. So uh, here's kind of, I guess, the architecture you want to think about is this is a, uh, okay, let's just get this one, a pendulum on a, double pendulum on a cart. So, okay, why did that one stop? Okay, let me, let me keep that one right here. <laughs> okay, so this cart is imbued with platonic knowledge of the pendulum system. So it kind of knows the length, the mass, and so we have currently perfect governing equations if there was no friction, no wind resistance, things like this. But when you do that, okay, this is supposed to be autoplay, um, it's very hard for it to stabilize. It's a very sensitive system, which means it just has a difficulty. But the idea is that if you can now say, well, the mo in other words, the model I have in there, which is this platonic model, platonic idealization, didn't account for the missing physics. You have recordings there. You could start learning models that would account for the frictional forces, wind resistance, put them in, and then have the potential to actually stabilize this. At least we could do this with synthetic data. We're working on this with a real pendulum. It's over in Steve's lab. Check it out. Awesome cinder blocks, state school. <laughs> Everything's WAP white. <laughs> it's amazing. They knew new architectures at state schools. Okay, here's, uh, but here's where this is actually going to be really useful. Uh, 
we're heading towards this, the digital twin revolution. Um, the idea is that you know, we're going to build these more sophisticated uh, robot manufacturing facilities, right? And here is a platonic version of this robot arm. But just like the double pendulum, this and this don't quite agree. Now, when you're trying to do precision manufacturing, you are intolerant to having these two models off. Right? And by the way, every robot will be slightly different. Right? You have a base robot state, which is I have you know, lengths like this, masses like this, but each robot will have a little bit different frictional forces there that you have to learn. By the way, what if I just oiled this one? It just changed. So you need an adaptive structure. We'll say, like, here's my base model, but as data is coming in, I can refine that model. And by the way, you don't have to even commit to the Cindy model to that getting that discrepancy. You could say, I'll learn a neural net, or I'll learn a dynamic node decomposition. There's a lot of different ways to fill in that missing physics. But it is an architecture in which you can say, I can have an adaptive structure that as the data is coming in, it can improve itself. Now think about this in contrast to Kalman filtering. Kalman says, I have a model, I have data. And what I do for my predictions is I balance the model and the data together depending upon their noise levels, right? The interesting thing about that architecture is the Kalman model never learns to update its physics, even though it's always off the same way. What this is saying is like, well, if my model is always off, can't I learn how to improve it as I collect data so that the model and the data start to become overlapping. So it's like a smart common filter if you want to think of it that way, right? It's a way that this thing should operate as it should learn, because that's what we do. We're the ones who update the common model, right? We say, oh, my model's not good enough. Let me go and write something down. Maybe I can improve it, versus this thing should just do it by itself, if that makes sense. This is hard. There's a lot of kind of challenges that go along. Uh, with this stuff, right, which is oftentimes you have limited measurements and data, noise. I told you that getting good derivatives is really an important issue. Multi-scale physics, latent variables, parametric dependencies, stochastic <coughs> systems. So let's say six challenges that are really sitting there the minute you go to trying to get a little bit more sophisticated, you immediately have to deal with them. Uh, there's two in orange and three in yellow. The three in yellow, we've already sort of taken steps towards, towards making progress. So Sam Rudy has found a way to do a very nice way of to denoising data streams to produce good X derivatives. Um, Multi-scale physics and latent variables, Kathleen has uh, actually made some nice progress on both of those to sort of at least first steps to showing here's some things you might be able to do to handle the fact that you have disparities in temporal scales that you have to separate to do good model building, as well as what if you don't measure everything and you have a latent variable space. Uh, parametric dependencies was also Sam. Um, still working that one. <laughs> that's hard. Uh, and then this one here, uh, th uh, that's a, it's still an open question. Like, if you have limited data, what can you do with that in terms of finding the, the model? Uh, there are just limits to what you can do there. OK. Um, with that, if you remember the first slide, I talked about coordinates and dynamics. At this point, I, even talked about, I haven't even talked about coordinates yet. All I assumed was that H was identity. I said, yeah, you know, every, and I kind of swept that under the rug. I just said, hey, let's go discover some models. I have X. But I told you at the beginning, I have Y, right? That's, that's my measurement. So I assumed that I had the state variable measurement. So really what I want to think about is, but wait a minute, uh, what about the coordinates part? OK. Um, so coordinates are extremely important, obviously. And uh, it, they're going to pair with this. And in fact, you could also say, well, maybe, maybe that idea of trying to go after a nonlinear model is just the wrong idea to begin with. What if instead you just tried to find a coordinate system where things are linear? So this is the idea behind Koopman embeddings is, is there a way I can find, move from my state variable x to some measurement of x. Let's call it g of x. So this is a function 
of the x, finite dimensional systems. I'm going to project into an infinite dimensional space. And if I get the g of x right, I can write down a linear operator. Now the great thing about linear operators is I'll just write down the solution for you by hand. Right? It's exponentials. Just plug it in, done. I can solve this closed form. So that is the attractiveness of embedding. Then I don't have to think about nonlinear dynamics. I'm done. I just have a linear system. There's no problems. Okay? So how do you do this in practice, though? That's, it's actually hard to do in practice. Let me give you two examples of it, and then we'll go from there. So the first is this one here, these Kuban invariant subspaces, which is, you just, this is like a Boyce and De Prima level problem. It's a two by two ODE nonlinear, got a quadratic nonlinear, You're very simple, right? But normally what you do is you sketch phase plane and you get the dynamics out. Or you can trade out to these variables, y1, y2, y3, which are x1, x2, x1 squared. So I've moved into a new coordinate system and in this coordinate system, it closes and is linear. So this is a different representation, but this, I can just solve closed form. I can tell you everything about its eigenfunctions, eigenvectors. This I have to a little bit work a little hard at because of the nonlinearity. So that's the idea of this linear embedding. And of course, it only works under certain conditions. A better one is Berger's. So here's Berger's equation, PDE. You have, uh, you have this wave breaking phenomena, right? You have a wave whose height travels depending upon its amplitude. So this is one of my first P, uh, nonlinear PDE models you learn in grad school. And then you say, oh, and I'm going to rest that collapse with, uh, you know, regularize it with diffusion, for instance. So I put some diffusion in there, and this is the kind of simulation you get. You get this shock type formation, but then eventually the shock is arrested by diffusion. So it's hard to work in these variables, but there's this Kohl-Hoff transform. Kohl-Hoff did this independently in 5051. He wrote this transformation down, which takes this nonlinear PDE into a linear PDE. Okay, so that's the idea behind this. Now, interestingly enough, if we look at the history of PDEs, this is, I think, the first one we knew that you could sort of do this with. The others that we knew were in the 70s, where we had the inverse scattering transform that could linearize a class of PDEs known as completely integrable. So nonlinear Schrodinger KDV with the inverse scattering transform, it was an integral transform that put all the dynamics into a linear space. And you come back. So it was a small class of PDEs. That's it. <laughs> okay, I will not cry. All right, sorry. I, need to <laughs> I don't really need this anyway. I just broke it. Don't tell them. <laughs> okay, so I have this PDE. Very few of these exist. They're hard. Like, oftentimes you can't do these in closed form anyway. Right? There's just a few PDEs we know of in our history that can do this. So instead, what we're going to try to do is say, um, and by the way, it's not even clear this is the right goal, make something exactly linear. Maybe the goal should just be say, look, let's take this strongly nonlinear system, make it weakly, not, weakly nonlinear, because then I can use asymptotics and perturbation. So I don't have to have an exact linear embedding. I just have to have that the dominant dynamics is linear, and then I can use perturbation theory to get corrections. Okay. So what we're going to do with this is train neural nets to do it. Okay, so this is a targeted use of neural nets, which is it's going to have one job. And that one job is to learn a coordinate transformation. And that's it. Now I put this quote here from Stefan Malat, which I, I just think he's amazing. Um, first sentence of his paper, Understanding Deep Convolutional Neural Nets. Supervised learning is a high dimensional, here's the key word, interpolation. I want to highlight that because we're going to come back to this idea of generalizability. Okay? Um, but by the way, we know a lot of you in the room have played around with neural nets, TensorFlow, PyTorch, it's all kinds of architectures, right? So uh, people are playing a lot with different architectures here. Now, the way I think about these architectures is they are ways of regularizing the solution. It's not always clear how they're regularizing. So it's very, you know, convolution is very interpretable, right? You look at little patches and you slide it across. So you understand how it's doing a regularization. But some of these aren't always so clear what they're actually doing. But they are putting structure and a constraint on the solutions you're going to get out. 
Some of them are highly favorable. For dynamics, deep residual networks are great. Why? Because you carry information down. It's like carrying an identity down, and that really helps you, because a lot of dynamics is based around near identity transforms. So why residual networks work is kind of obvious in the context of dynamics. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna try to do this, and we're talking about building linear coordinates, so let's, let's go to it, which is I'm gonna give you data, x, and I wanna move to new coordinate y. I'm gonna train a neural network to find a map that does this, and I can come back out. Now, what do I wanna have happen here? What do I want to happen in this new coordinate system? This is where you're gonna start putting some constraints on this. Well, what we did with Bethany originally, we said, okay, how about this? Let's follow up on this Kuhlman idea. Why don't we make it so the dynamics in this new coordinate system is linear? Okay, that's, that's our goal. So that when you go from y of k to y of k plus one, one step into the future, it's a linear map that takes you there. So that's trying to construct this Koopman idea. Now what we did is try to do this on the pendulum. That was the first problem. Right? We didn't have to go to fancy things. We just said, let's start with something. I know the answer. And it should be easy. Right? It's a pendulum. How hard can a pendulum be? Pendulum is super hard. And we failed. And it was obvious after the fact why we failed. But during the fact, it was not that obvious. And then, okay, so hindsight's awesome. Because then you go like, oh, yeah, it's just being dumb. But here, here's why we failed. Take the first correction to the pendulum. Cubic. What does it do to the physics? If you look at the pendulum, it's always staying two-dimensional, one-dimensional if you want, but you know, it's, it's low-dimensional. Remember when I talked about parsimony? It's like, why would I make this high-dimensional when it's clearly two? That's the intrinsic rank of this thing. But what this does for you, it complicates your life. It complicates it because what this does is it shifts frequencies and it creates harmonics. So if you do ask some totics around this, and you say my leading order solution is the linear base state, the epsilon u cube, what it does is, check it out, here's the frequency shift that you get, and here are these harmonics that you get. And if you go to next order, you get a sine five, next order, sine seven. So the pendulum, if I take this thing, just run simulations on it, you get something like this. This is a spectrogram and some, of the, okay, so all these little lines, these lines are right, these are just interpolation from MATLAB's P color. But here's the frequency and as I increase the amplitude, that's the frequency, here's the frequency shift of the base state. Here's that cubic that comes on, here's the quintic, there's a septip, whatever, you, you know. You start seeing that you see the structure, all this stuff is there. So now. Remember, I'm trying to build a model where this thing is linear in the coordinate system, but when I look at this, I have to parametrize all of this. I have to get all of this, which is higher dimension than just two. Partly because what this is doing is saying, I'm gonna build you a Taylor series expansion, okay? So you really can't keep this at two dimensions when you pinch down because you can't handle all of that. So the way we did it is said, okay, well, then what we need to do is if I want to keep this thing linear and pinch it, then my linear map here has to be parametrized by the frequency. So when I put the data in, I also give it a label of a frequency. So I learn a frequency label for all these trajectories. So when I get over here, it says, oh, I'm gonna give you a linear map, but it depends upon omega. Here's my linear map. So now I have a Koopman operator, depends on omega, and then this thing here now, can linearize all the dynamics because in some sense what this omega has done is swept into it the nonlinear dependence, the parametric dependence from the nonlinearity. And then you can keep it at two dimensions. All right, so let me give you two examples. Frequency of oscillation. So at, for each, for each, uh, you know, as you go to higher am amplitudes, they have different. Well, here you go. There, right there, these. <laughs> No, it just, it's just the period of oscillations. You can think about it that way. That's the simplest measure you might have. Yeah? So, omega, what the, we know what omega is, but what is it for the limit? 
it's, a, it's just a parameter, right? It's, so it's whatever the period of this thing is, right? No, no, but you have any there, so how, is, how does the, the network get when? You give it to it. Like, you, 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 you give it a label of here's the trajectories, here's the label of the period, right? So it has that to bring back in. And so, by the way, here are the nonlinear oscillations. Here's in your typical phase plane diagram, right? So, uh, you know, these are linear here, but you can see it starts to become nonlinear as you go away from the center, like, you know, bigger oscillations of the pendulum. Um, and what you can do is if you train this neural net, you can take this thing, basically transform it to linear all the way up, all the way up to that saddle. So this is that representation. And here, these dots represent hitting it by matrix A, and I can basically... I stay on these circles. You have a completely linear embedding. Here are essentially the eigenfunctions of that embedding towards, towards the pendulum. So the pendulum itself, it's not trivial. Um, you can also do harder problems like flow around the cylinder. Again, flow around the cylinder, you can embed it in a linear space along to parametrize. But we did a lot of work to parametrize. So what we were so excited about is uh, what Kathleen did, and this is what I want to, sh I want to show you here, is that, so the idea is to say, well, Kuhlman's hard. Making things really linear. So maybe the way to say it is, when you look at this, why would you try to linear? This is, this is trivially parametrized by one nonlinearity. Just, just put in a cubic and you've got the whole thing versus learning this parametrization. Why not make use of that? So what we want to do then is come back to this thing, relax that Koopman constraint in the middle. Instead of saying, hey, I'm going to pinch you down to the intrinsic rank and make you linear, I'm going to say you can be nonlinear and parsimonious. So now this is where part one and part two of the talk intersect. We're going to do the same architecture as before. Come to an embedding, learn a map. What do you want to have happen here? Here, is where you're going to enforce a Cindy model. You're going to say, in this new variable, to describe the dynamics, I will impose parsimony. Smallest number of terms, smallest rank, smallest intrinsic rank. Those are the two constraints. Those are the constraints that come there. And then you can ask the question, can you now discover the right physics of that system? So you're tying in this idea of discovering nonlinear dynamics in the right coordinate system. This goes back to my opening slide with planets. You see the planetary motion? What you first want to do is like, oh, if I move this into the heliocentric universe, I just get F equals ma. So if you just have the night sky, the idea would be to say like, oh, I'm going to learn for you that there is this coordinate system, heliocentric universe, in which F equals ma holds. That's the idea. Okay? So Kathleen, uh, okay, a couple, couple of comments about this, by the way, especially around generalization. I want to highlight this. This part, if you learn F equals a May, that generalizes. You can take F equals a May and say, I learned some physics, and now I'm going to go hit it on another system. But another system, I have to go figure out what its coordinate systems are. Right? So the coordinate system that you learn here is only specific to that data. It doesn't hold outside that data. But the dynamics you learn in the middle is the part that you have the ability to generalize with. Okay? Just want to highlight that. And so this is what you take with you. Oh, I learned some physics. Now I go to a new system. The first thing I have to do is figure out, OK, what are the right coordinates for that system? Right? So if you learn F equals a May by looking at Saturn, and now you want to launch a rocket to the moon, you've got to change your coordinates. Now all of a sudden, the Earth-centric coordinates doesn't make sense. That's the big, massive body that's acting on your rocket to put it on the moon. So now you switch to that coordinate system. So you have to be able to flex it. That's because that's, this doesn't generalize, but you still have the right dynamics inside. Uh, just to highlight some of the results with this, here is some of the results that Kathleen got. So a, a couple things she did. She showed this for, for instance, if you take Lorenz, you take, you run Lorenz, you put, you glue onto it three spatial modes, glue them together nonlinearly, throw all the data together. And then you ask the question, could you back out the Lorenz underneath from that? In other words, could you learn a coordinate transform where the dynamics are in 
are, are correctly inside, and in fact, you can do this. In fact, what you learn is it's one linear transformation away from what you actually put in. So there's this invariance that's there that you don't quite pick up, but it's the same equation under transformation. Reaction diffusion system. This one's a particularly fun and insightful, which is the pendulum. So here's like a video of the pendulum with a heat map showing where it's spending a lot of time, right? So it spends a lot of time on the big swings at the top, whips through. So if I give you a video of a pendulum, right? This is the idea. You are prejudiced. You're going to look at it and go like, hey, that's a pendulum, theta, theta dot. You already know the governing equations. You already, in fact, you have already know the correct coordinate system in your head that you should be putting that physics in. Your computer does not. You show it a video, it's just massive pixel space. So the first thing it has to learn if it's going to discover physics is say, I should transform that. I've got to learn a concept of a theta, theta dot. And once I learn that, I will learn theta dot is sine theta. So that's what this architecture does. The initial part says, give me your pixel space find theta, theta dot, regress, find theta double dot, sine theta. So it's joint discovery of the coordinates and the dynamics. If you have any questions on this, please ask Kathleen. She'll be here all week. <laughs> and she actually trained this neural net to do this. This, so. is, this is an effect with me, right? Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot of ways to, to think about these, right? This is just one, uh, one, one version of that. Um, I do want to finish with some of these thoughts here around generalization uh, and limits. Um, and back to that Malat quote. So when you train these things, right, I actually, okay, I have yet to see a convincing example of any of these things generalizing. Wherever you learn the data. So for instance, I'm going to give you a simple example. Flow around the cylinder. Suppose I have three Reynolds numbers, 50, 100, 150. Now, if I gave you data at 50 and 150, and you said, oh, look, it generalizes to Reynolds on 100. I didn't put that in my training data. I'd say you're interpolating, right? Because what happens between Reynolds of 50 and 150, it's, it's kind of pretty smooth between those, like a, like a diffeomorphism. If, if that's, I think, what Giannis would say, between these. So it's not, it's not that uh, surprising that it works at 100. You could say it generalized. I don't think it generalized at all. I think you interpolated to that space. If you trained at 50 and 100, and then you try to do 150, this is where you break. Because that's extrapolation. So I think we have to be really careful with that word. I try not to use it ever if I can in a talk, except to say it's problematic. Because I, just because I tried this, I worked over here, I didn't train data, that didn't mean it generalized. It, it's just unbeknownst to you, you just interpolated. I, I think that's the only places where, and by the way, I've, I've done a lot of little toy examples with Lorenz, right? Where you just take the Lorenz system, where I know everything, well, I don't know everything, but I, I know a lot about it, and you just, it's so easy to break a neural net's prediction capabilities when you do anything that looks like extrapolation on the simplest model. So the only time it works is, is when it's interpolating. Final thing, limits. That's another thing I don't think we talked enough about, which I'm always surprised the electrical engineering community isn't all upset. Because they think about signal to noise all the time, right? For them, signal processing is king, and none of this stuff is magic. If you have a noise level in your signal, it is very hard to discover anything going on below that level, right? It is unreasonable to expect that we can take these measurements that are filled with noise and discovering some model that's underneath there. We can't even see it. I'll give you an example, and this is work that's up on the archive now, which is we took ball drop data. This is with uh, David Higdon, who's at Virginia Tech, along with Brian De Silva. And if you look at the ball drop data, you would say Aristotle was right, not Galileo. It seems that uh, these balls all have different characteristics. They all fall differently. Right? It's clear from the data that this is the case. Not only that, you can't. So the interesting thing I think we found with that is the minute you propose a 
physical law, like a universal physics law, is the minute you have to propose a discrepancy model for that. Because the data actually doesn't obey this. I think this is an amazing leap that Galileo took to just say gravity's constant. I don't think he had the data to back that up. Newton's still dropping balls off St. Paul's Cathedral when it was built, highest place in London. Right? There's I, I think they're still trying to convince themselves this is actually true. The G is constant. More than that, in Principia chapter two, entire chapter devoted to what happens if a sphere is accelerating through a fluid? Why is he doing that calculation? He's doing that calculation because the fact is ball drops show that gravity doesn't. I have to explain away why all the data does not actually back that up. And the way he did it is he was able to compute frictional forces of fluid being displaced from the front to the back. Once you have that there, then you can say, yes, the balls are falling at a constant g, but the reason they're falling differently is because this big ball is displacing a whole bunch of fluid, and this small ball is not. And that's why they look like they're falling under different gravity effects. So we did something kind of careful here. And there's also things you can't discover with limited data and noise. It's very hard to discover the, the 1 over v squared resistance that comes from that from the data. You have to have very precise data to actually get that. So I just want to say that, that we also have to be reasonable about expectations under signal to noise, that we can't just discover everything if we just build a big enough deep neural net. That you can't. This, they're, they're just limitations that are, are fundamentally there. So I'm going to finish here, which was a slide I presented earlier. Uh, this is just one viewpoint. There's a lot of us working in this, a lot of us understanding. Like I said, I highlighted some of, uh, I, Giannis has talked about this. There's a lot of other groups talking about this idea of coordinates and dynamics. There's a lot of ways after it. What we're going for is the parsimony angle. And I think that's a pretty effective way to think about it in terms of getting interpretable models out. And, um, and it's a great regularization tool in training of your data systems. I'll stop there. Thanks.